Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Reading with Grandma. We are going to continue on our Once Upon a Time Treasure of Fairy Tales. We've read quite a few stories, and I would like to thank all my new subscribers and my new commenters. Thank you so much for joining my channel and allowing your kids to read and listen to my stories. I hope you'll pass it on to your friends, and more and more people will come and enjoy, enjoy story time. So we left off with Sleeping Beauty. Today we're going to read the story of Three Golden Flowers. Now I never have heard of this story. I've heard of millions of fairy tales growing up and raising my children, but this is one that's new to me. So we're going to go on this adventure together. <clears throat> Three Golden Flowers by Lisa Harkretter and illustrated by Marty Noble. Once there was a chief who ruled an island tribe. He lived a happy life until one day his daughter became very, very ill. The chief called for the tribe's healers. The healer did everything they could for the princess. They gave her herbs, bathed her in oils, and burned spices to soothe her. But the princess continued to grow weaker. Soon she could barely lift her head from the pillow. The chief was deeply concerned and sent for the tribal wise man. Find three golden orchids, the wise man said upon examining the princess. Their scent will cure her. Where are these golden flowers? asked the chief. They grow only where the sun shines through the water, said the wise man. The chief proclaimed that any man who could bring him the three golden orchids could marry the princess. The great warriors of the tribe, eager to earn the prince's hand in marriage, explored every inch of the island, but they could not find golden orchids. On a nearby island, a poor man lived with his wife and three sons. The sons were not great warriors. They were modest farmers like their father. When the family heard the chief's proclamation, they were excited. They knew exactly where to find the flowers that would cure the princess. Each year, nine perfect orchids, delicate and golden, grew behind a waterfall in a hidden valley. The oldest of the brothers went to the valley and picked the three largest orchids. He placed them carefully in a basket and set off in his canoe across the sea. When the eldest brother reached the chief's island, he met an old fisherman on the beach. What have you there? said the fisherman. The young man knew that everyone was searching for the orchids. He was afraid the old man would steal the basket if he knew what treasure lay, be lay inside. Fishing worms, the young man said. The fisherman smiled and allowed him to continue. The young man reached the village and soon he stood before the chief. When he opened his basket, he was surprised to find worms, just as he had told the fisherman. When the old eldest brother returned home, the middle brother decided to try his luck. He too met the fisherman on the beach. Like his older brother, he was suspicious and lied to the fisherman. Later, when he met the chief, he also found his ba basket filled with worms. Now only three golden orchids remained. The youngest brother picked them and set off to see the chief. He too met the fisherman. Again, the fisherman asked what was in the basket, but this boy was honest with him. I carry flowers that will kill, cure the princess, he said. Indeed you do, said the fisherman. Then he gave the boy a bamboo flute. It will bring you luck, he said. The boy thanked the fisherman and ran to the village. At first, the chief was wary to receive him, but the boy opened his basket to reveal the golden orchids. They were as perfect as when he first picked them. As soon as the princess smelled the orchids, her eyes opened. She looked up and smiled. She thanked the boy, and soon the two were laughing and talking together. The chief was pleased that his daughter was cured, but he did not want the princess to marry the son of a farmer. You have cured my daughter, he told the boy, but now you must prove that you are worthy to marry her. Tomorrow you must take 100 parrots to the forest. In the evening, you must bring them all back safely. If any of them are missing, you cannot marry my daughter. The boy spent the next day chasing the parrots, but by nightfall, he could not find a single one. Suddenly, he remembered the lucky bamboo flute. He trilled a few notes, and all of the parrots flew to him. 
When the young man returned with all 100 parrots, the chief could not believe his eyes. If my daughter will have you, said the chief humbly, then I will welcome you into my family. When they were older, the princess did indeed marry this boy. They lived happily ever after on the island. And that's the end of The Beautiful Flowers. Now our next story is George and the Dragon. Again, this is another new one that I have not heard of. So we're going to take the adventure to night down all together. George the Dragon by Brian Conway and illustrated by Tammy Spear Lyon. This is the tale of George the Dragon, a story that has been told for more than 15 centuries. It takes place during a time called the Dark Ages. When kings ruled the land, wizards cast spells, and monsters roamed free. This story begins in a land of fairies. The queen of the fairies had taken in young George when he was abandoned as a baby. The fairies raised George to be brave and strong. They taught him to be a noble knight, skilled with the sword, but even more skilled with his mind. In time, the queen of the fairies called George to see her. It was time for George to seek his destiny. Your journey begins today, she told them. You will have many adventures ahead, to be sure. You should not expect an easy pass path. Life is seldom easy. The queen of the fairies spoke kindly to young George. The world is filled with monsters and battles. You will meet kings and paupers, wi wizards and witches, evil princes and kind princesses, she said. As you travel, you must always remember one thing. The queen added, tapping George's silver battle helmet. Your greatest weapon is your brain. Then George set off. He traveled for weeks. As he approached a town called Saline, he noticed the land had changed from lush and dark green to desolate. It seemed the ground had been crossed by fire. There was no grass, only the darkest mud. The trees were bare and black, and a foul stench filled the air. George made his way through the bleak landscape until he saw a castle in the distance. A high, solid wall surrounded the castle and a small city around it. The gate was closed up tight. A beautiful young woman approached George. You must leave here, she warned. It isn't safe. But I am a brave knight here to help you, George said. It is my destiny. I will assist you at all costs. Alas, sir, the woman replied. You are but one man. I fear you cannot help. I will not leave, said George. Please let me try. I am Princess Sabra, she said. Come with me. Sabra explained why the kingdom lived in such fear. A wicked dragon lived in the caves in the nearby forest, she told him. A horrible beast was ravaging the land and eating all of the animals. The princess explained that when the dragon finished eating the animals, he would certainly look for a new source of food. When that happened, the townspeople were in danger of becoming the dragon's next meal. There must be something we can do, George said. Sabrina told George of a cave in the dark forest where a wise old hermit lived. She thought that he might be able to help. They found the cave and entered quietly. Sabra and George crept up to the old hermit, who stared into his fire. He did not look at them, but he began to chant. Long ago, it was told, two brave souls would come to know the only way to save the rest. The serpent's weakness is in his breath. With these words, and an hourglass appeared at their feet. They were puzzled, but the hermit would speak no more. George and Sabra left the cave. They knew they must hurry to the dragon's lair. There, they had to get there while the dragon slept. It was their only chance. That hermit speaks in puzzles, Sabra sighed. What will we do with the ancient timepiece? George studied the hourglass. The hourglass will lead us, George whispered. We must wait until all the sand has dropped through. George and Sabra found their way to the lair. The dragon was the 
was asleep when they entered, but not for long. Suddenly the dragon stirred. It stood and rubbed his eyes. George watched as the last grain of sand dropped through the hourglass. The glass turned icy cold. At that moment, the dragon yawned a great fiery yawn. George knew this was his chance. He threw the hourglass into the dragon's mouth. The hourglass broke apart on the dragon's tongue in a cloud of icy mist. The dragon was furious. He looked down to see George and Sabra. Then he stretched out his body before rearing back to hurl a fiery blast at them. To the great relief of George and Sabra, but to the horror of the dragon, only soft snow came from the great beast's mouth. The dragon took a deep breath and tried again, but his mouth was suddenly frozen shut tight with ice. The hourglass had been filled with magical icy sand. The dragon jumped into the deep warm lake to keep from freezing from the inside out. That dragon never bothered another soul. Some have seen them come up for air on occasion, but only on very warm nights. The dragon would not dare stay out of the warm water for too long for fear of becoming an icy statue. George and Sabra had saved the kingdom. News of the dragon's defeat traveled back to the village. When George and Sa Sabra returned, they were greeted with cries of joy and triumph. The grateful people of Selene were no longer prisoners in their own castle, in their own kingdom. The king offered George bags of gold and thanks, but George wanted no payment for his deeds. I have set out in this world to face many adventures and adversities, George told the people. Knowing that I was able to provide a service to those in need is reward enough for me. George continued on his journey. The legend of his bravery preceded him, but with every stop along the way, he added this to the story with continued acts of bravery. Villages far and wide came to know George as the brave and noble knight that he was raised to be. And that, boys and girls, is the end of our stories for today. Please tune in it for tomorrow for our next adventure on reading with grandma. I hope you had a good time listening to the stories. Leave me a comment on what you think or what you'd like to hear. Hit the like button. Let's get to let's try to get to 25 likes on this one. And ring the bell so you know when I'm reading again. Have a good day everybody. Bye-bye.